I think you have a swinging pendulum, uh, certainly in Western philosophy and perhaps even in Eastern philosophy, between mentalism, the claim that consciousness is fundamental, is the most fundamental thing, and physicalism, the idea that everything can be reduced and explained in terms of neurons and molecules. Modern scientists are very much on the physicalistic end of this mm -hmm. as a group, although there are individuals, of course, who feel very differently about it within science. Mm -hmm. Now, as a cognitive psychologist, you're developing, uh, I suppose, a fresh perspective on these things that attempts in some way to bypass this mind-body debate. In a way, yes. Uh, I, my own view on it is that the mind-body problem, the various positions on whether reality is really mental or physical, is a fundamental problem. It's not a problem that as a scientist you ever get to resolve. And so we have to try to do science within a framework where what we do empirically will last. And the fact is that even though behaviorists didn't believe in consciousness, a lot of their research tells us a lot about consciousness. So uh, mm -hmm. I think as a psychologist, ultimately you cannot ignore consciousness no matter what position you take on the mind-body problem. And so you confine yourself to understandable and testable scientific questions. That's basically what cognitive psychology is. It's, a, it's an attempt to look at things in the most testable way and just let's not get caught up in the major philosophical issues. Mm -hmm. Now the early psychologists of the 19th century developed an experimental method known as introspection in which mm -hmm. they asked people to sort of turn inwardly and describe the, mm -hmm. the contents of their mind in, yes. in various experimental mm -hmm. contexts. Yes. This approach was highly criticized by the behaviorists, wasn't it? It was. It was the major point of attack by behaviorists and philosophers who were behaviorists and some people from Physiology, like Pavlov, uh, who was the discoverer of the conditioned reflex. The uh, Russian physiologist. The Russian physiologist, right, who criticized psychologists and said, in fact, psychology is not possible mm -hmm. because psychology to Pavlov meant an understanding of consciousness in scientific terms. So psychology was very much attacked on that issue of introspectionism. Uh, it turns out from modern historical research that a lot of the reasons they were attacked were not true. They were basically just points of attack. Uh, we're still doing introspectionism every day in psychology. We ask people about their experiences. There are major parts of our lives that are affected by psychological research that are based on experiences. For example, if you look at your stereo, your audio system, it's graded in terms of decibels, and decibels are graded that way because of what's known as the psychophysical law, which is the relationship between the physical stimulus and the psychological perception yes. of that stimulus. This was discovered 150 years ago. It's still good science. And the fact that it was discovered by people who were strong mentalists, who really believed that consciousness is the basis of the universe, doesn't matter very much. It's still very mm -hmm. important in good science. Well, the field of psychophysics was discovered by Gustav Fechner, the, right. the German researcher who, who also wrote uh, many tracts about the nature of the human soul and even That's the right. soul life of plants, yes. which brings up an interesting point, mm -hmm. that, and, and that is that the very word psychology, if we take it back to its mm -hmm. Greek origin, means the science or the study of the soul. Right, and, and the soul obviously has something to do with consciousness. Yeah. But the uh, people who dominated the field for many decades and called themselves psychologists actually preferred the term behavioral scientist or, or, mm -hmm. or behaviorists. They wanted to do away with the notion of the soul completely. Right. There was a tremendous thrust to only talk about those things that are physicalistically observable, the stimuli that come into one's sensory organs, and the responses that you perform that are visible from the outside. So stimulus response behaviorism became really the dominant point of view, not because people didn't recognize that there were mental images, for example, but because they, were, they thought that there was really only one good, approved, orthodox way of doing science. And I think we've uh, freed ourselves up mm -hmm. a little bit. 
there was a time, I suppose, when it's, it's fair to say that poets and artists and uh, writers, philosophers, mm -hmm. uh, historians, uh, people in the humanities were all writing and thinking and talking about consciousness and psychology was sort of going blithely along in a different direction as if none of this w was uh, of any relevance. You're right. It's an extraordinary paradox. I mean, con I mean, psychologists were bright people. You know, they're interested in lots of things. And right around 1900, there was a tremendous movement towards stream of consciousness writing, uh, as shown in Joyce and Los Passos and other kinds of novelists and poets of the time. Uh, B.F. Skinner, who later on became the standard bearer of radical behaviorism, the behaviorism that denies uh, consciousness, started off as a writer. Mm -hmm. His initial training was to become a novelist, and his ambitions were to become a novelist. And the kind of uh, writing that he steeped himself in was stream of consciousness writing. And so we have this extraordinary story of this person within a single lifetime, or even within the single year of his life, in which he encounters a crisis and moves from wanting become, to become a stream of consciousness novelist to the very opposite extreme, where he is a psychologist and a behaviorist who denies the possibility of being conscious. It's one of the major psychological puzzles of the history of science, I think. Let me ask you, Bernie, what, what got you involved in the study of consciousness? Well, it's a slightly long story. I think all of us growing up in the 60s were interested in big issues, and uh, I was interested in big philosophical issues. And then I began to read some philosophy, and the contemporary philosophy at that time, which is very much like behaviorism, said that philosophers really can't do anything. They can't do anything but study the language of scientists. Logical positivism, right. in effect. Logical positivism was the dominant view in philosophy as I was reading it at that time. And it didn't inspire me very much. Uh, it wasn't interesting to do philosophy at that time. And the thing that appeared to be interesting was to do psychology. And as I discovered after a while, when I was at the university, um, uh, the classes that I took were not nearly as interesting as many of the things that I could read outside of the classes. Work by Freud, work by Nietzsche, work by stream of consciousness, psychological novels, uh, all sorts of interesting things. I finally found myself involved with meditation and meditated for quite a long time before I overcame my skepticism and realized that there was something very powerful going on there. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand or believe that there were really good persuasive sources of evidence on this. There were lots of people who knew lots about it, but they were not able to persuade skeptics, scientific skeptics particularly, about it. And so I decided that consciousness was really a terribly important problem. What also became clear, however, was that scientists weren't anywhere close to dealing with higher states of consciousness. And so it became rather clear at that point that some kind of bridge needed to be developed between ordinary psychology, scientific psychology, and ordinary consciousness and these extraordinary states of consciousness mm -hmm. on the other hand. And so I've been working on the ordinary side.